If you have your Bible, open it up, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll begin our study there in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 15 through 18. As you are turning there, I'd like to say just a couple of things. Number one, welcome. It's good that we have visitors here with us. It's good to see so many brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope and pray that you had a great weekend and that you are refreshed as we are worshiping our King. We've sung songs of glory to our Father in heaven, and what a blessing it is to be able to come together as people of God and to celebrate our salvation and to remember the great things that our Father has done for us. Second thing I want to say is uh, thank you. Uh, every Sunday, obviously, is a special day as we come together to worship our King and to worship God. Uh, but July 2nd is also special for myself and for Nikki. Eight years ago, July 2nd, we arrived here in Beaumont, Texas. And as we came here to Beaumont, Texas, we asked the question, can any good come out of Beaumont, Texas? And the answer, Beaumont, Texas, where is that place? And the answer to that, of course, is yes, much good has come and continues to come from Beaumont, Texas. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, we love you very much, and I appreciate, we appreciate your love, and we appreciate your support, and the great things that are going on here at Dowlin Road. I'm still thinking about last week, where we celebrated uh, two new uh, Christians. Uh, Jaron Michael obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trina Whitfield obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are so many things for us to celebrate and to really think about the great things that are taking place here, and so I just want to say thank you. I remember July 2nd, I think we got here in the middle of the afternoon, and we went over to uh, Wesley's house. I think it was Wesley, Judy, Max, and Lee. And there was some strange dish that Wesley served us, and he called it gumbo. I said, what is gumbo? I've never had gumbo. And there's something else I'll never forget, and that was the praline that he made. I said, now this, I've never had this. And if this is anything like manna, man, I'd love to eat this for 40 years. <laughs> day and night. Just keep making it rain, praline, and man all day. But nonetheless, uh, we do appreciate you guys, and we love you guys very much, and there's still great work for us to do. And I mentioned Trina, and I mentioned uh, Jaron Michael. I want to mention, too, in the foyer, there's a whole new uh, deck of cards, uh, invite cards. Let's get those cards out. Let's continue to do the work of God here. Let's continue to be a beacon of light for um, Beaumont, Texas, as we strive to give glory to our Father. Let me begin with a question here, and the question is this, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? That can make some people feel a little bit uncomfortable. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? I hope and pray that every baptized believer here will say, yes, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe what we've been doing over the last half hour here can be described as spirit-filled worship. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. However, some people get uncomfortable with this language, and if that's you, don't be. Our theme for 2017 has been making the most of our time from Ephesians chapter 5. And what we're going to do this morning for a few minutes, we're going to look at one verse in particular, verse number 18. But what I want to do first, I want to go back and just quickly recap what we have studied so far from Ephesians chapter 5. Remember, this book is made up of six chapters. Really, the first half of the book is Paul reminding the saints of the blessings that they have in Christ, what God has done for them, that they have all spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ, that while they were lost in their sins, Jesus died for them, and by grace they have been saved, and the, the heavenly blessings that they have. The second half of the book really is a lot of application about how they are to conduct themselves and how they are to live. And when we pick up our theme for this year in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 15, let's just quickly look at what we've already addressed. The Bible says, therefore, be careful how you walk. Paul said this, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. At least three times in this, in this chapter, I believe, Paul used that language, walk. And he reminded them, you be careful how you walk. You walk with wisdom. You walk with the way that you know, or by the way you know how to. Verse 16, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Don't waste your time doing the things of the world any longer. You make the most of your time as the people of God. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul used this contrasting statement. Don't be foolish. You are in Jesus Christ. You are to be an imitator of Jesus Christ, an imitator of your Father in heaven. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You can understand God's will. You can follow God's will. You can be pleasing to your Father in heaven. That's what he emphasized in Ephesians chapter 3. 
the apostles and the prophets, they received revelation, they wrote it down so that Christians could read it and also understand it. And then in verse number 18, where we'll spend our time this morning, Paul would go on to say, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul continues with what he's already been saying by making another contrasting statement. Don't do this. Don't be like this. But rather, be like this. And so in verse 18, that's what we're going to find. He said, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And so Paul is going to help us to understand some things. And I want to talk about what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit. This is something that we are supposed to be. And this is language that we find in the Word of God. And so we don't have to be ashamed or embarrassed about using this type of language. Paul is telling the saints, or he told the saints, and he wants us to know, be filled with the Spirit. And so that's what we're going to look at. What does that exactly look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And what are the implications and the applications that that will have for us in our lives? So let's talk about that a little bit. Here's what I want to do. First, I want to look at that first part of that verse where he said, do not get drunk with wine. Depending on the translation that you read, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Some translations may say, don't get drunk with wine, for that is reckless behavior, reckless action. It is debauchery. It is something that will ruin your life. None of those phrases are good, right? Do not get drunk with wine. He's already been telling them, you don't walk any way, any just any way you want to. You walk with wisdom. And you understand and you redeem the time because the days are evil. And you understand what the will of the Lord is. And so what Paul is going to emphasize and what we need to understand to make sure we understand this idea of being filled with the Spirit Paul is emphasizing something to the Christians then and for us right now. Do not get drunk with wine. We are to avoid the works of darkness. And what we find in Ephesians chapter 5 is Paul really emphasizing this idea. You are no longer in darkness. You don't live any any, any way you want to live. You are in the light. You are a child of God. And so therefore there's a proper way to conduct yourselves. Will you read with me, please, going back to verse number 1 of chapter 5. All the answers are found in this chapter here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 1. Paul said, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Our example is our King in heaven our Father in heaven. This is how you are now supposed to walk because you've been delivered from your sins. You've been redeemed from your sins. Look at verse number three. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving a thanks. You see the difference? This is all you have left behind. Sexual immorality, impurity, greediness, filthiness, silly talk. But now, because you're in Jesus Christ, now you have an attitude of thanksgiving. Now you are going to walk differently. And here's why we need to make sure that we walk differently. Because if we decide to go back to the things of the world, we decide just to to walk and live our lives any way that we want to, we're not going to be in heaven with our Father. In verse number five, he said, For this you know with certainty, be certain about this, my friends, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Don't play games with God. You can't play games and I can't play games with God. we got to make a decision. Whose side are we on? How are we going to live our lives? Are we Christians or not? Paul is saying, listen, the things of the past are in the past. This type of lifestyle is going to lead you straight to hell. And if you continue down this path, you're not going to be with God in heaven. But you have been redeemed. You are in Jesus Christ. You have put off that old man and put on the new man. And so he says, you can know this with certainty. Don't deceive yourselves and don't allow the devil to deceive you. You want to live in such a way and follow the works of darkness? You will not be with me. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Judgment will come your way if you decide not to walk as you know you should. 
Therefore, because of all of this, do not be partakers with them. Don't have fellowship with them. Don't have that interaction with the people of the world, with that type of lifestyle, with that type of conduct. That should never be named among the children of God. For you were, verse number 8, formerly darkness, but now you are in light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There is that walk. You see, he's reminding them that's who you used to be. But now you are in the light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Our mission, it's not about us, but it's all about God. And it's about us learning what's going to be pleasing to the Lord, understanding his will, and then doing his will. That's what Paul is making and we're reminding the Christians here. And we're going to get back to verse number 18 in a moment. But he keeps reminding them, you avoid the works of darkness because you're now in Christ. Because you have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Verse number, verse number 9, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. So not only are we not supposed to participate any longer in certain behavior, Paul said you shine a light on that behavior. You help someone. You expose that behavior. You're not going to be involved doing that any longer because you're born again. You're a new creature in Christ. So now you expose that behavior. You don't have anything to do with it, but rather expose it. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, you see this connection here? Do you see the thought that he's making all throughout the chapter? You walk as your father in heaven. You walk like him. You imitate him. You strive to follow in his footsteps. And you leave everything else behind. You be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine. Avoid this type of behavior because that's not who you are any longer. You're in Jesus Christ. And now there is a certain way that we are supposed to walk. Turn back to chapter 4, and I want you to see in verse 17, I'm, I really want to drive this point home. Because what Paul is trying to get us to see, we've got to redeem the times, we've got to make the most of our time, and listen, you going down, and going down the path of getting drunk and drinking and engaging in that behavior, you are wasting your time. We are wasting our time if we're doing that. We have a bigger purpose. We have a bigger mission. And we need to make the most of our time. And that is shining light to the world and giving hope and helping others to see who are engaged in that behavior that they can be delivered from it. And so we don't have time to be engaged in the very things that the people of the world are doing. Rather, Paul says, you expose, you expose the very things that they're doing. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 17, Paul said, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk, there it is again, our walk, you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, and the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Brothers and sisters, we're no longer ignorant, are we? We have come to understand the will of God. We know what God wants us to do. We know how we can be pleasing to our Father. And so we need to make sure that we're no longer acting in an ignorant manner by doing the things of the world. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of, the, uh, lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So he's saying you leave all that behind. You have laid off that old self, and now you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. You've crucified that old man. A change has taken place. And so when you look back in Ephesians chapter 5, because they were to walk with wisdom, redeem the time, understand the will of God, there could be no rooms in their lives to be drunk with wine. No rooms in their life, no room in their lives to be drunk with wine 
or to be under the influence of wine. I want to drive this home. I want to say this about five or six times so you can really understand what this idea here means to be filled with the Spirit. Because what Paul is going to do, he's making a contrasting statement. Do you see it? Do not get drunk with wine. That's the idea. Don't be under the influence of wine. You're a child of God. There's no room for you to be under the influence of wine. There's no room for you to be under the influence of alcohol. Why? Because under the influence of wine is what you used to do. Well, you're no longer that person. You're a new creature in Christ. Being under the influence of wine would cause recklessness and room for the devil. And yet Paul would advocate you don't make any room for the devil in your life. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, that's exactly what Paul said. He said, do not give the devil an opportunity. We start drinking, we're going to give the devil an opportunity. Do not get drunk with wine. You are not to be under the influence of that, of, of wine. Because that's going to cause recklessness and room for the devil. Do not be under the influence of wine because, because that's going to cause us to lose self-control. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so there's no room for us to be under the influence of something like wine or alcohol, whatever the case may be. We are to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit by demonstrating self-control in our lives. Being under the influence of wine was everything that Paul was trying to make sure that they were not doing. You don't go back to that lifestyle. You expose that behavior. You don't engage in that behavior, but rather you expose it and you help those individuals who are still in bondage. Do not get drunk with wine. Do not engage in this work of darkness. Do not be under the influence of wine. Now, I'm emphasizing this, and let me just say this too. And I know there's always arguments about this. Don't believe the beer commercials, okay? Fourth of July weekend is here. And what are a lot of people doing? Oh, man, they're getting ready for Tuesday. There's going to be a lot of consumption of alcohol. Young people, don't believe the beer commercials. There's nothing good that will come from you if you decide to start drinking. Nothing good. And yet so many times we still allow the devil to deceive us. I know all the arguments that are out there. But when you think about Ephesians chapter 5 in its entirety, why would we want to make any room at all for wine, for alcohol? When we are on a mission from God, that we're no longer engaged in that type of behavior. We're not supposed to even participate in that type of behavior. And so what Paul is trying to get us to see here, there's no room for this. There's no room for a couple of beers, a couple of shots, Jack Daniel, whatever, you, whatever it may be. There's no room for that because we are new creatures in Christ. And what he's advocating, what he's, what he's striving to, to help us to see here, you are not supposed to be under the influence of wine, but rather you're supposed to be under the influence of who? You see that? You're not supposed to be under the influence of wine, but rather under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I think you guys have got it, because if you understand the contrast, then you understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, do not be drunk with wine. You're not under the influence of wine, but be filled with with the Spirit. And so when you understand the contrast that he's making, you can understand this idea of being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is the idea of being under the control or influence of the Holy Spirit. You're not supposed to be under the control of alcohol or the influence of alcohol, but rather under the control and influence of the Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you a couple of things about this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. When Paul used this language here in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, he was not saying, number one, he wasn't saying that the Holy Spirit was literally dwelling inside of their bodies, nor in this context was he referring uh, to supernatural gifts. Rather, he's referring to them being under the influence, the control of the Holy Spirit. The word fill sometimes means to be controlled by or influenced. There are a couple of examples I want to show you. Look over in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 45. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 45. As Paul was preaching the gospel, he came across some individuals. They were not happy with him. And in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 45, we see this language of these individuals who were filled with something. The Bible says in Acts 13 and verse number 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, 
They were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. They were filled with jealousy. The idea of being controlled by that emotion. They were filled with jealousy. In Acts chapter 5 and verse number 17, we see this language again. Almost it's exactly the same uh, as from uh, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 5 and verse number 17. Here's the case with the apostles uh, and the high priest. Acts 5, 17. But the high priest rose up along with all of his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. That's the idea of them being under the influence or control of that emotion. They were filled with jealousy, filled with rage. Now, depending on the context, it can mean a couple of things. Look at Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, we find the apostles who had gathered together in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 2, and the first four verses here, the apostles were gathered together together. There came, in verse 2, from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, talking about the apostles. And they were all filled, the apostles, with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. You see, the apostles here, they received power from on high. They were filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where they were able to perform miracles, speaking in tongues, and they would also perform miracles throughout the rest of the first century. So context is going to determine this idea of being filled with the Spirit. When we go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, the way we understand this idea of being filled with the Spirit is based upon the language that Paul used in that text. Do not get drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Spirit. And so what Paul is doing here in Ephesians 5 and verse number 18, he's making a contrasting statement. You're not under the influence of alcohol. Rather, now you need to be under the influence or the control of the Holy Spirit. It is the Word of Christ which we are supposed to be filled with. The Bible has been given to us by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the way we allow the Spirit to control or influence our lives is by listening and following his words that have been revealed to us. Does that make sense? That's the idea of being filled with the Spirit. To be under the control, and I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but I'm trying to do this for the sake of emphasis. The influence of the Spirit, and the way this is when we listen to and obey the words of the Holy Spirit. There's a parallel text in Colossians chapter 3, and verse number 16. The book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians are very similar. And in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16, I think this really may explain or shed some more light with what we found in Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Listen to what Paul said here. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. I think that's the idea here. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within us. The word of Christ needs to be in us so that it will lead us and instruct us and and change us. This is how we're going to be filled with the Spirit with his word, listening to his word. And not just merely listening to his word. We have people who can come here every Sunday and listen to the sermons, leave here, and then go right back out into the world, have sex with their boyfriend and girlfriend, go to the clubs, get drunk, forget going to the clubs. They may just stay home and get drunk. You can hear the word of God. You can listen to the word of God. But you also have to obey the word of God. We have to do this. Does that make sense? So we have to allow the word of Christ to dwell in our hearts where we not only listen to it, but also obey the words of the Spirit. And that's the idea that he's trying to get across. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The context of this chapter is about Christians being in control of their lives by laying aside the lust of the flesh. And the way that they were to do that, the way that we are to do that, is by understanding the will of the Lord and being filled with the Spirit. Does that make sense? Now the question becomes, are we filled with the Spirit? Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be under the influence of the things of the world. but Rather be under the influence of what the Holy Spirit says in His Word. And allow His Word to lead you and to guide you. Our lives, our motives, our actions will help us to see if we are truly filled with the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, if we're truly going to make the most of our time, it's going to require that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, what will that look like? Well, number one, it's going to, uh, it's going to look like this. It's, it will, uh, we'll see that we will truly have left the past in the past. That old man must be laid to rest once for all. Instead of participating, endorsing our former wicked deeds, we're going to go and expose them. I keep going back to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, because I think that's powerful there, where as Christians now, we're not going to have that interest. That desire eventually is going to be gone. Because when we are filled with the Spirit, when we allow the Word of God to richly dwell within us, it's going to get to a point where we're going to, whatever the devil has to offer us is not going to be enticing. It's going to look disgusting. There's not going to be anything that he's going to be able to offer us that we are going to want. And so that's what Paul is trying to get across here. When we're filled with the Spirit, in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. You go one step further. It's no longer not what you're no longer doing, but now what are you doing? And what will you also do for me as your king? You expose this type of behavior. That's what it's going to look like to be filled with the Spirit. You want to know what else it's going to look like to be filled with the Spirit? Look at verse number 19 of, of Ephesians chapter 5. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Man, when we are filled with the Spirit, we're going to have some Spirit-filled worship. And our worship, I believe, is Spirit-filled because we are listening to the words of the Holy Spirit following the pattern that the Spirit has given us when it comes to worship. And when we are filled with the Spirit, when we are allowing the Word of God to dwell in our hearts and allowing the words of the Holy Spirit to influence us, how much greater is our worship going to be? I believe our worship is great. But when we are filled with the Spirit, we're going to have an intense desire to worship God even more. Worship is not going to be a drag. Worship is not going to be tedious. Worship is not going to be, oh man, it's not 11.30 yet and he's still up there preaching. Worship is going to be about pouring out our hearts to the Lord. Because we're going to remember all the wonderful things that God has done for us. Being filled with the Spirit will increase our desire to be closer to our King in song and prayer and reading. And I'm not just merely talking about here on Sunday mornings. But having that intense desire to worship our King. Being filled with the Spirit is going to look like this. Look at verse number 20. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. Man, when we're filled with the Spirit, when we are allowing the words of the Holy Spirit to have an influence in our lives, and when we are diving into the Word of God and remembering that we were lost in our sins, that one time we were, we were enemies of God, that we were going to, uh, going to have the wrath of God to fall upon us, that we were dead in our sin, but now we are alive in Jesus Christ. When we focus on that, and when the Word of God is richly dwelling in our hearts, you will not, it, will be, it will be impossible for us not to be thankful. And that's what it's going to look like to be filled with the Spirit. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. Every day, every moment, we have reason to be thankful. We have opportunity to show God how thankful we are by our worship and by how we listen to the words of the Holy Spirit and how we leave the things of the past truly in the past. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, my friends, worship is going to be something that we desire even more. We're going to give thanks to God. And look at verse number 21. Don't leave this verse out here. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, when we are allowing the words of the Holy Spirit to influence and to change our hearts and to change our lives, we're going to learn how to get along. This is going to change our relationships with one another. We're going to truly love one another. And we're going to assist one another. And we're going to be compassionate towards one another and forgiving and merciful and gracious. That's what it's going to look like when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, and when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we've got some young people here who are going to be getting married here soon, it's going to affect our homes. Verse number 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know what that's going to look like? 
It's going to change our homes. It's going to change the dynamics of our relationships. It's going to cause husband and wives to be patient with one another. It's going to cause us to be careful how we speak to one another, how we treat one another. It's going to change everything in our lives. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing the words of the Spirit to control or influence our hearts, listening and obeying the words of the Spirit. It's not an option. It's not just something that we do when we feel like it. It's something, something that we are supposed to be. Something that we're supposed to be doing every day. I've shown you some reasons. Being filled with the Spirit is going to be a reason for us to be thankful, and to worship God more, and to change our relationships. But you want to know why we should be filled with the Spirit? Because we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sees how you and, and I, how we live our lives. The Holy Spirit sees our conduct. And He sees whether or not we're living and listening to His Word. And I think the biggest motivating factor for all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to listen and to obey His words that He's given us, is so that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 29, look at what Paul said here. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You want to know why we need to be filled with the Spirit so we don't grieve the Holy Spirit? Isn't it amazing how our actions, our motives, our conduct can have an impact in heaven? How we can grieve the Holy Spirit. So what that means for us when we have malice in our heart, anger, bitterness, lack of compassion, and when we speak unwholesome words, when we go out and get drunk, have sex with our boyfriend and girlfriend, we're not only hurting ourselves, we're not only hurting our spouses or our children, or even this congregation, we are hurting the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a game changer? We just sang all those songs about giving glory to God. We can give Him glory by the way that we walk, the way that we talk, the way that we conduct ourselves. People, this applies to you. There's some verses, especially for you in chapter 6. Obey your parents. Why? For this is the right thing to do, okay? You see, it affects all of us when we allow the words of God to influence us and to change how we live. Being filled with the Spirit is not merely what we're no longer doing with respect to sin. It's also adding new actions that are pleasing to our Father, to, our, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit will affect our hobbies, our speech, our jobs, our education, our money, and even our attendance here. It will change our lives. The question is, are we filled with the Holy Spirit? I hope we all can say yes. Our daily goal needs to be listening and walking according to the words of the Holy Spirit. When we do, we will make the most of our time. So let's make sure that right now, that we are pleasing to our God in heaven. Maybe there's someone here who needs to become a Christian. The Holy Spirit has given you the words, given you everything you need in, in the word of God to know what you need to do to be saved. Jesus would say in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We had two precious souls who were saved last week. Is there someone else that needs to be saved? There's someone else that needs to listen to what the Holy Spirit has recorded for us so that we can be right with our King. If that is you, come now as we stand and as we sing.